Remember Prometheus, everyone? Remember how I tore at a new arsehole and called it the movie that finally killed the Alien franchise? Remember when I called it a dumb, meandering, self-indulgent, totally unnecessary vanity project from a past his prime director, which abandoned everything that made the original movie so compelling and interesting, and replaced it with a bunch of half-baked philosophy questions and a muddled, contradictory and unsatisfying backstory that nobody even asked for? Remember how it seemed almost inconceivable that anyone would want to make another movie in that universe? And even if they did, how it couldn't possibly be dumber, less coherent and more self-indulgent than Prometheus? Well, prepare to have your expectations subverted harder than a TNG fan, because here comes Alien Covenant to suck up 122 minutes of your life and give you nothing in return except a banging headache and a lingering sense that something very bad just happened. It's a bit like a night out in Glenrothes, only there's less junkies trying to stab you in the face with broken buckfast bottles or dead strippers caught underneath your car axle. Anyway, it's time to talk about Covenant, so let's dive right in and break this turd down. The movie begins with a flashback to Guy Pearce as Peter Wayland, minus the unconvincing old man makeup, when he first creates the arsehole android from Prometheus. They play piano, talk about the finite nature of human life, and Wayland asks asks him to choose a name for himself, and because the statue of Michelangelo's David just happens to be sitting there, well, I think you can guess what he goes for. Now straight away, this scene contains a number of red flags that you're about to witness a fucking train wreck of a movie. For example, Pretentious classical music that tries to establish a pseudo-intellectual tone. Stark white futuristic environments interspersed with pieces of antique art symbolising the declining influence of traditional culture and individuality in the face of cold, sterile technology. References to David the Giant Killer, foreshadowing David's own role in taking down the physically larger, more powerful and technologically superior alien bodybuilders. Conversations between a brilliant but ultimately mortal man and his immortal creation about the finite nature of human existence. Questions about where humanity comes from and what the true meaning of life may be. So what can we discern from this opening scene? Well, Basically, it means this movie's going to be repeating the same fucking mistakes that made Prometheus such a tedious, pretentious, overblown chore to get through. Anyway, I guess Guy Pearce costs a lot of money these days, so it's time to flash forward to the present day. It's 11 years since the events of Prometheus, and the transport ship Covenant is on its way to colonise a new planet. Just like Prometheus, the ship is watched over by an android while the crew are in hypersleep. And again, he's played by Michael Fast bender. Fuck's sake, stick to the formula, eh, Ridley? So this android's called Walter, and he's having a great old time until a solar flare comes out of nowhere, like a good RKO, and damages the ship, which forces him to wake up the rest of the crew so they can make repairs. But oh no, the captain burns to death inside his cryotube. How unlucky that the only person to die happens to be the most competent and level-headed officer on board. I'm sure that won't have disastrous repercussions later. It does beg the question. Question though, why use an experienced actor like James Franco just to give him like three seconds of uncredited screen time? How's the pie? So good. <laughs> anyway, unlike previous movies, this crew is made up of married couples because I guess this is kind of a one-way mission, so it makes sense for them to go together. Or you could just find a bunch of career-minded singletons and let them partner up once they get to their destination. Because honestly, I can't think of anything more disastrous than forcing married couples to live and work together in highly stressful and possibly life-threatening situations that demands close cooperation and a unified chain of command. You know, I I once got into a blazing row with my girlfriend over whose shot it was in a game of pool. We broke up shortly afterwards. Not that it matters anyway, the actors and the script are so shitty that concepts like having to obey orders from your romantic partner or the possibility of personal disputes clouding professional judgement is basically left unexplored. What I'm saying here is that until the movie straight up tells us, you'd never guess these people were married based on how they deal with each other. This is also where we get introduced to the theoretical protagonist of the movie, the Ripley wannabe. 
I honestly can't even remember what this character's name is because she's so fucking boring and generic. She's got no personality or charisma, and she's not helped by the absolute plank of wood they found to play her. Sigourney Weaver at least looked like kind of a badass. She looked like she knew what she was doing, and when she was motivated to take action, you believed she could see it through. Why don't we have actresses like that anymore? Now all we get are a bunch of soft, bored, dead-eyed simpletons that look like they rolled off a fucking assembly line. So once things settle down from the solar flare, the crew receive a transmission from a nearby planet. And wouldn't you know it, this place looks like an even better prospect to colonise than the one they're actually heading to. I'd like to point out that there was probably a reason why their original target planet was chosen, perhaps because it wasn't filled with deadly pathogens and murderous alien life forms. Anyway, the Ripley wannabe thinks they should stick to the plan, but dumbass replacement captain decides to check out the new planet and find the source of the signal. So they land on the planet and go for a walk with absolutely no protective gear or biological precautions, and then they find a derelict alien donut ship that crash landed. Then one of the team gets infected by an alien spore that's floating around, which naturally prompted me to think, what the fuck? So you're telling me there are spores floating around everywhere that could infect the team at any moment? So like, why isn't everyone infected within minutes of arriving in this place? I mean, they all have to breathe, don't they? They all have ears and noses and eyes. Why does it only happen to a couple of people? Are they just really unlucky? Were they not wearing their plot armour? The facehuggers from the early movies served a very logical purpose. They formed the basic life cycle for the aliens, and pretty quickly, you got to understand the nature of the threat they posed. They weren't out to kill you, they were out to impregnate you. If you were quick and resourceful, you could kill or isolate them before they could strike. But if they got hold of you, you were fucked. Either way, you could at least see them coming and try to avoid them. That's why the medbay sequence in Aliens was so inciting and thrilling. Ripley and Newt were trapped in a confined space with these fucking things, and it was a race against time to save them before they got taken down. Now apparently, there's just invisible shit floating around everywhere that could strike anyone at any moment. And if that's the case, there's no tension now because there's nothing for the characters to run away from or try to fight off. It's just random death waiting to strike. Anyway, Disposable Extra Number 1 gets sick, so they take him back to the lander, but then he starts having a sweet rave party. <laughs> And an alien bursts out of his back. Oh wait, no, this isn't an alien. This is some kind of proto-alien called a Neomorph. Because this movie likes to tease the possibility of actual Xenomorphs, like it's some kind of crazy unexpected surprise or something. <coughs> Fuck off, film. Also, these people are genuinely some of the clumsiest, most incompetent motherfuckers I've ever seen in my life. And I'm from Scotland. We're still learning joined up handwriting here. They're falling over, they're bumping into things, they're slipping in pools of blood, they're getting their feet jammed in automatic doors, they're negligently discharging weapons in a confined space. Then Disposable Extra Number 2 shows up with a shotgun, but it turns out that shooting highly combustible fuel cells isn't a good idea. Why are these things even stored out in the open like this? Why aren't they shielded in some way? Why isn't Disposable Extra Number 2 aware of the danger they pose? Meanwhile, the Ripley wannabe and the other idiots are also on their way back to the lander when Disposable Extra Number 3 gets sick because of the random death spore things, and then another alien bursts out of his mouth. Wait, so is that like a different alien? alien from the other one? Why did one come out of the guy's back and the other one came out of this guy's mouth? Because it seems like it'd be a lot easier to come out through an existing orifice than try to break your way out through a human spinal column. You see how it becomes kind of hard to buy into a movie that basically has no logical consistency because it makes up the rules as it goes along. You don't know what matters because everything could change at the drop of a hat. So anyway, they come under attack from a pack of not xenomorphs and more disposable extras die. Jesus, that's like half a dozen in the past 10 minutes alone. And I guess we're supposed to care about this, but we totally don't because these people aren't really characters. They're just meat sacks waiting to get torn open. Seeing them die is about as engrossing as watching a digital counter ticking down. Remember in the original Alien how the movie took its time introducing us to the crew of the Nostromo, building them up as unique and fleshed out individuals with their own quirks and personalities and motivations? Remember how existing tensions and disagreements within the group got amplified in a believable way as the pressure started to mount, and it actually felt significant and impactful when each
each one of them got killed. That was a good movie. I missed that film. But anyway, before all of the disposable extras get killed, someone shows up to save them. And oh look, it's David from Prometheus. Didn't he have his fucking head ripped clean off his body? Nah, I guess he got better. Walk it off, Dave. Coach says it'll be fine. Now, because there's a storm on the way, and there's always a fucking convenient storm in these movies, David takes them back to a deserted temple where he's been living for the past ten years. But there's a bunch of dead bodies lying everywhere. And when they question him, he's like, yeah, me and this other girl arrived here in the donut spaceship and accidentally released the black goo which killed all life on the planet. And then she died afterwards from, uh, unrelated reasons. So there's nobody around to corroborate my story. What can you do, eh? Wow, that was an unlucky chain of events. I love how nobody questions this extremely sketchy explanation. Then again, these are the same people who landed on an alien planet without even wearing face masks, so go figure. Then it's time for more pseudo-intellectual bullshit as Walter and David have a nice chat. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, you mighty, and despair. Then they kiss and finger each other. Watch me. I'll do the fingering. But then another not xenomorph gets inside the temple and dumb replacement captain shoots it as David tries to communicate with it like it's a fucking pet dog or something. Then David's like, come take a look at this huge sinister alien egg. Don't worry, it won't hurt you. And dumb replacement captain is like, okay, so guess what happens? <coughs> Fuck off, film. How are any of these people possible? They have as much independent thinking power and common sense as a gender studies graduate and all the instinct for self-preservation of a manically depressed lemming. Why are we meant to empathise with them again? So Walter goes looking for the missing idiots and that's when he stumbles upon what's left of Elizabeth Shaw. Remember Shaw from Prometheus? Remember how she fought against the odds to be the last human left alive and even performed a caesarean on herself to remove an alien squid baby from her body before it tore her apart? Remember thinking how cheap and unsatisfying it would be if she was killed off screen between movies and all we got was a really fake looking mock-up of her in the sequel? Well, there you go. I guess the writers were big fans of Alien 3, which basically undid the entire ending from the previous movie in order to give us something that was as bleak and depressing as humanly possible. We're all gonna die. The only question is when. Fuck off, Alien 3. Oh Ridley, why do you hate us so? More important, why do you hate your own previous movie? Why would you substitute one generically strong female character played by a somewhat interesting actress for another generically strong female character played by a totally bland, uninteresting actress? It's not a good switch, my friend. So anyway, it's time for the big reveal from David. And if you didn't see this one coming from like 10 miles away, you're probably a character in this movie. It turns out that the destruction on this this planet wasn't an accident. David came to the alien bodybuilder's homeworld and intentionally released the black goo that killed them all. Then he murdered Shaw so he could experiment on her and make more of the not xenomorphs that he plans to use to wipe out humanity. What. what. The. Fuck. Are you really telling me that this super advanced galaxy spanning alien race that's been around since before the dawn of life on Earth was wiped out by some random dickhead android using their own black goo? Wouldn't there be safeguards against this exact possibility? Wouldn't there be some kind of early warning or planetary defense system to protect them? Wouldn't they be a little bit suspicious when one of their lost donut ships suddenly returns after being missing for like 10,000 years? For that matter, if they lost contact with the weapons facility from the first movie, why did they make no attempt to send a rescue mission to determine what happened to it? And what's David's motivation for doing any of this? Why spend years creating the not xenomorphs to wipe out humanity when the black goo is perfectly good at the job? Why crash the donut spaceship on this planet and be forced to wait potentially decades for someone to stumble upon you when you could travel directly to Earth with it and release the black goo and kill everyone in a matter of minutes? Why does nothing in this film make any sense? See, the problem with trying to answer questions about the origin of life is that you need to provide good, satisfying answers instead of just spawning more dumb questions. Like, if the best you can come up with is that a race of alien bodybuilders created us for unknown reasons, then decided to destroy us for equally unknown reasons, then who created them? Why did they decide to destroy us? 
Why did David destroy them, but also wants to destroy us? Is he just a straight up asshole who wants to kill everything? Ah, whatever. So the two androids get into a fight, David disables Walter, and then he goes after the Ripley wannabe. But then Walter shows up again and they have another fight, and it's as visually confusing as you might expect, and this time David gets killed off screen. Nope, nothing suspicious about that whatsoever, just move on and don't question it. Then Danny McBride comes eastbound and down with a brand new lander. Wow, that was convenient timing. And they escape back up to the Covenant. But oh no, disposable extra number 10 was impregnated by a face hugger. And another alien bursts out and kills more disposable people in a shower scene. But then the Ripley wannabe impales it on a loader truck and blasts it out into space. Where have I seen this before? Jesus, why are the only partially good elements of this film stolen from other films? So the Ripley wannabe is about to go into hypersleep, but then she realises that Walter is actually David in disguise, because apparently he was able to sever his own hand and totally change his appearance in the few seconds he was off screen, and get aboard the Covenant without triggering any kind of alarm or warning system. Then David puts her to sleep and barfs up some alien eggs in the same way I barf up a dodgy kebab, and the movie ends, thank fuck. So that's the plot for Alien Covenant. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll have reached the end of this movie and promptly asked yourself, what the fuck did I just watch? It's like the writers tried to cherry pick successful elements from the first two Alien movies, added some goofy Marvel style action scenes, a heavy dose of pretentious philosophical musings stolen from movies like 2001 and Blade Runner, and slapstick humour that looks like it came out of a fucking Adam Sandler movie. The problem is that while each of these elements is fine by itself, they simply don't mesh together into a coherent package. Instead, what you end up with is a confused Frankenstein's monster of a movie that fails at everything it tries to do. It fails to capture the brooding terror of Alien because it doesn't understand how to make the Xenomorph scary anymore. The scares are either predictable body horror that we've seen a million times before, or a mess of incoherent new concepts that probably sounded good in a brainstorming session but don't make any sense in reality. Also, there's absolutely no way you can show an alien in broad daylight and not have it look ridiculous. It fails to create characters that feel like individuals, never mind people you'd want to know more about. They're bland and generic, and worst of all, they're shockingly stupid. I mean, I thought the geologist from Prometheus that manages to get lost despite having a holographic map, GPS tracking, and constant radio communication was bad enough, but holy shit, these guys are next level, man. Let's consider some of the amazing decisions they make in the course of this film. They decide to go off mission, endangering the lives of thousands of colonists aboard the Covenant simply because they hear a John Denver song playing over the radio. That's fucking John Denver. That's Take Me Home Country Roads. Gonna be kidding. Oh no, I never kid about John Denver. I mean, that's not even a distress call, that's just some asshole listening to music. They venture onto the surface of an unexplored alien planet with no respirators, face masks or protective gear of any kind. It's a total mystery how two of them end up being infected by airborne pathogens. They separate into smaller groups that could easily be isolated and killed off, rather than sticking together and covering each other as they pull out. They failed to isolate infected patients despite the very obvious risk of contaminating the entire crew, and they failed to properly screen anyone for potential infection when they do return to the Covenant. They allow themselves to be misled by an android spinning a very obviously bullshit story about what happened on this planet and his own involvement in it. One of them stands directly over an alien egg for no other reason than because David asked him to do it. The characters in the original Alien worked well because not only did they have distinct and well-rounded personalities, but they generally made smart decisions, taking logical measures to counter the growing threat of the Xenomorph. But these fucking idiots just seem to lurch from crisis to crisis with no idea what they're doing or how to get out of it. As a result, well, you don't really care if they make it or not, because none of them deserve to. The movie also fails to create a worthy successor to Ellen Ripley. Simply putting a sweaty actress in a tank top and giving her a gun doesn't make for a strong, compelling character. I mean, Numi Rapeface wasn't exactly Sigourney Weaver either, but she at least looked kind of interesting and she held your attention on screen. And by the end of the movie, you kind of empathised with her situation, even if her decision to go to the alien bodybuilder planet made no 
fucking sense. But then they decided to just kill her off between films in a move that felt cheap and undeserved, like they were pressing the reset button on a plot thread that wasn't convenient anymore. The decision to have two characters played by the same actor worked about as well as these things usually do. I mean, I like Michael Fassbender as much as the next guy, but I'm not convinced I want you to see two of them in the same movie. I didn't really buy into the idea of David as an antagonist either. I mean, he was kind of an asshole in Prometheus, but he was basically just following orders. He was even willing to help Shaw once Wayland was dead. There was nothing to indicate he wanted to wipe out the whole of humanity. But nah, we have to play into the pseudo-biblical, wannabe poetic bullshit about creations ultimately turning against their creators when their illusions about divinity get shattered. And I guess that point really cuts to the heart of my issues with this film. If you want to make some grand sci-fi epic that tackles the big questions about the meaning of life, then fine, go ahead. But don't take that concept and try to shoehorn it into the alien universe in a shameless attempt to cash in on fan enthusiasm. Just like Prometheus, Covenant tries to take the Alien franchise even further down a path that nobody really wants to follow, paving its way with ideas and set pieces begged, borrowed and stolen from other, better movies in the series. And the end result is a dull, tensionless, joyless, feckless, brainless and ultimately pointless film that shouldn't have been made. A movie whose few good bits aren't original and whose original bits aren't good. Anyway. That's all I've got for today. Go away now.